We are continuing our study of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, and our text this morning is actually going to be verses uh, 10 through 19. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 19. And as we turn in the word together, let's pause and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and goodness to give us the scriptures. Lord, remind us that the book we hold in our hands is not common. It's not uh, derived from man or man's wisdom, but it is your very word. It is the living, breathing, active word of God. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in a mighty way right now. Lord, removing any distractions from our hearts and minds, Lord, and enabling us to focus in on this truth. And Lord, we pray that you would be at work rebuking, correcting, teaching, and training us, furnishing us with what's necessary to serve you, to bring glory to you. May your Holy Spirit truly powerfully be at work in us for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, reading from Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 10. This is what Luke writes. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered into entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear the truth of God's Word. So, last week we studied the details of one of the most impactful conversions in the history of Christianity. We saw the details about how Saul of Tarsus was confronted by Jesus on the Damascus Road. But, here's a question for you. Has Saul been truly converted yet? He's definitely blind now, right? But is he saved yet? Is he truly converted yet. We know that he was on his way to persecute the church and Jesus stopped him in his tracks and he learned, he learned, he's blind, but he learned Jesus was alive and that by persecuting his church, he was persecuting Jesus. And so he knew that Jesus was the glorious son of God who has risen from the dead, but is he truly converted yet? Well, last we saw Saul, he was being led by the hand, blind as a bat, into Damascus where Jesus told him to await further word. Okay? Don't you love those periods of waiting on the Lord? That's a little dramatic for Saul where you can't see for a few days, but he's waiting. So it's always fascinating to learn about conversions, especially about the conversions of men and women that God has used in mighty and powerful ways. Because for all of God, we're all God's servants. God uses different people in different ways. And it's always interesting not just to study the lives of the giants, the heroes of the faith, but also to hear about, well, who's the one who led them to the Lord? Right? And so here we know often the, the case is these 
heroes of the faith are often led to the Lord by unknown, anonymous, uncelebrated believers who are just faithfully sharing the gospel, right? So one of my great heroes of the faith is the great British preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, okay? Spurgeon lived in the 19th century. Are you familiar with how Spurgeon was saved? Spurgeon grew up in a Christian home. His mother was a strong believer. His grandfather, who he spent a lot of time with, was a preacher himself. And yet, despite his upbringing, uh, a young Charles Spurgeon was very, very unhappy. He wrote this, I was years and years upon the brink of hell. I mean, in my own feeling, I was unhappy, I was desponding, I was despairing. I dreamed of hell. My life was full of sorrow and wretchedness, believing I was lost. That's how his younger life was. He went to many churches, he said, looking for relief, to, be, to learn how he could feel better, how he could get real, rid of this, this pain and the, the sorrow of his sin that he was feeling, and he never really got an answer. And then one Sunday morning in January of 1850, Charles Spurgeon was 15 years old, and he was on his way to go worship at a church. But as he was on his way to worship at a church, a bad snowstorm hit. And it was so bad, in fact, that he had to change his plans. He diverted himself down a side street, and he ended up taking shelter in a small primitive Methodist chapel with about 12 people there that morning. Spurgeon sat in the back underneath the gallery. The regular pastor, preacher, was not able to make it through the storm. And so Spurgeon says a thin man, whom he supposed to be a shoemaker or a tailor, got up to preach in the pulpit. He announced and read his scripture text for his impromptu sermon. It was Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, which says, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Here's the words from Spurgeon's autobiography. He records his reaction. He said, talking about this lay preacher, he said, he had not much to say, thank God, for that compelled him to keep repeating his text. And there was nothing needed by me at any rate except the text. Then stopping, he pointed to where I was sitting under the gallery and he said, that young man there looks very miserable. And he shouted, as I think only a primitive Methodist can, look, look, young man, look now. And then Spurgeon says, then I had this vision, not a vision to my eyes, but to my heart. I saw what a Savior Christ was. Now I can never tell you how it was, but I no sooner saw whom I was to believe than I also understood what it was to believe. And I did believe in a moment. Isn't that beautiful? True conversion, right? And of course, if you ever studied the life of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Lord used him in powerful ways to impact and encourage countless people in the faith. And what was the ultimate cause of him coming to the Lord that morning? Well, there was a providential snowstorm that led him inside a chapel he probably would never went to otherwise. And there was not even a regular preacher there, but a lay person preaching an impromptu sermon calling on Spurgeon to look to the Lord for salvation. That's Jesus at work. Right? That's Jesus at work. So we look at our text this morning, and it centers on this otherwise unknown man named Ananias. What do you know about Ananias? Does he pop up? Does he write letters of the Bible? Is he a New Testament author? We don't know anything about Ananias other than the fact he's a Christian living in Damascus. Later on, when Paul talks about Ananias, he says he was a devout man, a Jewish man, who who had respect of the Jews. But that's all we know, okay? This guy shows up on the scene, and he's out really quick, all right? And yet the Lord uses Ananias in a mighty way and crucial way to lead Saul to fully trust in the Lord Jesus. So our text this morning indicates that Jesus uses his church to demonstrate his love and forgiveness to repentant sinners. 
Jesus uses his church to demonstrate his love and forgiveness of, of repentant sinners. See, because when I read this text, and when I was studying this text earlier this week, there was just one question that kept popping out to me, one question that this text is demanding we answer. And here's the question. Why is all this necessary? Right? Why does Jesus send Ananias at all? Why? Couldn't, couldn't Jesus just cut out the middleman, go right to Saul, give him what he needs to hear, and send him on his way? Why do we need this character Ananias from Damascus, right? Well, why, why are we doing this? I imagine Jesus, he started the work with Saul. He could do it himself. He could finish it, right? But yet we know Jesus doesn't do that. He goes through the trouble of bringing in Ananias, and he goes through the trouble of this third party. And so that, as we seek to answer that question, what I want to show you is a pattern that is being established in the book of Acts, okay? So in chapter 8, what we saw was uh, Philip having a very thriving and successful ministry amongst the Samaritans. And God, Jesus says, no, Philip, I need you to go to a desert road in the middle of the day and go talk to one guy who's reading from Isaiah 53, right? The Ethiopian eunuch. And we see that Jesus arranged this meeting between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And now here we see Jesus arranging a meeting between Ananias and Saul. And not to give it away, but in next chapter, chapter 10, Jesus is going to arrange a meeting between Peter and a Gentile named Cornelius. And we're seeing this pattern repeating itself. Why? Why is Jesus using these, these middlemen? Pardon the phrase. Right? Well, why is he not just having one-on-one -on -one meetings with these people, saving them, and sending them on their way? He doesn't do that. Instead, what we see is Jesus insists on using his church to bring non-believers into the fold of his people. He insists on using faithful men and women who love him to bring unbelievers into the fold. Now, I, I don't think I need to tell you that has this, that's a significant truth for us today and how we need to be viewing ourselves and the ministering of the gospel that Christ calls us to. Right? We, we have that role of reconciling God with man and bringing uh, those who are repentant, trusting in Jesus, into the fold of the people of God. So this morning, I want to flesh out this idea, and my goal is to just answer this question. Why did Jesus send Ananias to meet Saul? Why did Jesus send Ananias to meet Saul? I have two major answers for that question. The first reason Jesus sent Ananias to meet Saul was for Ananias' sake. For Ananias' sake. Let's just walk through the text, and then we'll come back to this idea, how this was for the benefit of Ananias. Look at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So here's our introduction to Ananias. He is a disciple living in Damascus. We don't get much more information on him than that, okay? In chapter 22, verse 12, we're told that he was a devout man according to the law, he was well spoken of by the Jews living in Damascus. That's your full portrait of Ananias from the Bible. Okay? It's all good, but it's not a lot. Right? So that's what we know about him. He's devout. The Jews like him. And he loves Jesus. Okay? That, that's what we know. And in verse 10, we see Jesus speak his name in a vision and calls him out. And he says, Ananias. And notice the text says, who said it? The Lord said it. The Lord said it. Who's the Lord here? It's not the Father. It's not God the Father. It's actually referring to Jesus. Explicitly we'll say that the Lord here is referring to Jesus. And what we have here is uh, marks all the frequent patterns that, that are often shown in the Old Testament of how God calls out individuals for some important job. Okay? What we see is a calling by name, and the response by Ananias was what? Here I am, Lord. Does that remind you of any Old Testament people? All right. All right. So when God approaches Abraham, he says, Abram. And he says, here I am, Lord. And then he does the same thing for Jacob. 
He says, here I am, Lord. He does the same thing for Moses and Samuel and Isaiah. And every time it's the same reaction. God is speaking and the servant says, here I am, Lord. And now here's Jesus saying, Ananias. And Ananias says, here I am, Lord. Now, do you see and understand what Luke is saying to us is very clear. He's pulling on that Old Testament pattern to show us that Jesus is God. That Jesus is the Lord. Just as Yahweh called on Abram and Jacob and Moses and Samuel and Isaiah, so Jesus is calling on Ananias. All right, we see, we see that here. So Jesus is clearly being equated with the God of the Old Testament. But, but notice Jesus has a mission for Ananias. It's an unenviable mission at first glance. Verses 11 and 12. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man na- of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, first of all, I love how detailed Christ's instructions are for Ananias, right? So this reminds us that even though he's glorified, he's in heaven, right? He is yet intimately familiar with the details of our lives. Because Jesus basically gives him GPS directions, right? All right, here you go, Ananias. Go down Straight Street, all right? You're going to go that way, and there's Judas's house. That's where you go. So here we have the divine Son of God in heaven giving these very detailed earthly distru- uh, instructions about where, where he was to find Saul. And he's supposed to go to this street called Straight. Now, Straight Street, I've never been to Damascus, but... I trust my research. Damascus Straight Street is still there. It is actually one of the world's oldest continually occupied streets in Damascus. It is they, the, one of the main east-west thoroughfares through the city. And so Jesus is sending him on Straight Street. You want to know why it's called Straight Street? It's straight. Yeah, thank you. All right. And notice, again, I haven't been there. I can't verify it, but that's what I read. Um, and notice, Jesus even tells Ananias what Saul's going to be doing. What's he going to be doing when he gets there? He's going to be praying. He's going to be praying. In fact, this is kind of like an inception here. He's going to be having a vision about you coming and giving him his sight back. So what Jesus is doing here is he's giving double visions to both Ananias and Saul to confirm his will. He's going to do the same exact thing in chapter 10 with Peter and Cornelius where he'll use double visions to confirm his will and what he wants to have done and so ananias is given his marching orders from jesus he has the street address no problem right easy well there is a slight problem ananias heard about saul okay so look at verses 13 and 14 but ananias answered lord i've heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at jerusalem And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Now, I I love the reality of all this because Jesus speaks. And in this vision, right? He gives Ananias this vision and this mission. And Ananias' instinct for his own self-preservation is to say, Ah, Lord, are you sure about this? I don't know. You know, I've heard about this guy. Uh, he, he's not friendly to us. He's got a reputation. He, he likes to attack Christians. Like, he really hates us, Lord. Are you sure you want me to help this guy? Are you sure? And so Saul obviously was an effective persecutor because word had reached Damascus about what he was doing, and word had reached Damascus that he was coming for them. Right? And so Ananias says, I've heard all the evil he has done to your saints. First of all, Take note, write this down if you like to. First time Christians are referred to as saints in the New Testament in, in the book of Acts here, right? They're referred to as saints. They're holy ones. But notice that they're also, they're tipped off to Saul's current mission. They knew what he was doing. And so they're getting the reports about what Saul was up to. So is Ananias wrong here to question Jesus? What do you think? Would you question Jesus? <laughs> it's not so easy, is it? What do you think? I, I would think most of us would say this is entirely reasonable to be concerned 
right, from Ananias. Because Saul was like a rabid dog who's been caught in a trap. And what Jesus was telling Ananias to do is, go set that rabid dog free, right? He's blind, he's bound up, right? He can't hurt you right now. And, and, and Jesus is saying, yeah, go set him free. Go set him free. Kind of how I felt when I was trying to release a possum from a trap I had. Um, that's a different story for a different day. But anyhow, it's like I'm trying to set the thing free, and it's trying to attack me. Um, so anyhow, he, he's concerned. He's obviously concerned about it. Now, Ananias is questioning things and not sure he wants to set him free. And yet notice how Jesus is patient. He is gracious. He understands Ananias' concern. He knows that it's difficult to hear. And so he gives him some more information. Look at verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Jesus graciously repeats the mission and says, I have plans for him. I have plans for Saul. He is my chosen instrument. You see how... Let me ask you a question. Do you think that this was just for Saul? Do you think that Jesus has specific plans just for Saul, just for his apostles? Do you think that he has specific plans for your normal, run-of-the-day, average believer like us? Do you think that he does not specifically and willfully prepare us with gifts and with neighbors and friends and families and co-workers that he places us around for the sake of a mission like this to bear his name? Now, obviously, Saul was unique. He, he's going to be a, a great apostle. He was going to go a, and preach the gospel to kings, right? We're going to see that in the book of Acts. He's going to go to the Gentiles. He's going to the Jews. But don't for a second think that Saul is unique here in the fact that he is Christ's chosen instrument and that Christ has not chosen each of you as his followers to serve him. The Lord is the one who chooses us. He's the one who chooses which gifts to give us. Jesus has specific plans for you in his kingdom. He has equipped you. He has called you. Are you carrying out his plan? And so Jesus has chosen Saul to carry his name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Just, just hold on. Stay with us here in this study. We're going to see that throughout the book of Acts. Paul is going to be known as the apostle to the Gentiles, right? But what does he do every time he goes to a new city? Where does he preach first? A synagogue, right? So he's going to bear the gospel to the Jews. He's obviously preaches to the Gentiles, and he will be finding himself on trial a few times, even before kings, and he will share the gospel there as well. And notice that last little note in verse 16. It's a little ominous, isn't it? I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So up until now, Saul has gained an infamous reputation for making Christians suffer. And now Jesus says, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for the sake of my name. Is this a punishment? Is Saul being, I, I asked this question last week, I'm going to ask again, is this Jesus saying, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you worse? Is that what this is? Is Jesus just going to punish Saul for his past behavior? Uh, I would tell you that this is not a punishment. This is actually the normal expectation for all Christians. I know you don't want to hear that, but that is the reality. The book of Acts only echoes what Jesus teaches in his Gospels, and it's this. If anyone's going to follow me, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow after me. Right? Jesus also said to his disciples, they hate me, your Lord and Master, they're going to hate you too. Right? Jesus suffered more than anybody has ever suffered in the history of this world. Nobody suffered more than Jesus, the Son of God. Nobody. And he calls us to follow him. So why is suffering a strange thing to our ears as believers? Why do we think we should be exempt from that? Why do we think we should be above suffering for the sake of Christ? Paul warns Timothy, a young pastor in 2 Timothy 3.12, he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus warned people before. He says, before you're going to follow me. You know, right now we were like, follow him, follow him. We'll figure it out later. Jesus says, no, before you follow him, count the cost. Count 
the cost. And so Paul was going to suffer for the sake of Jesus. And we can read about his suffering in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me read a little bit, verses 23 through 28. Paul says this, With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times, by the way, you don't survive that usually, um, three times I was shipwrecked, at night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and part from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the church. Is that suffering? I'd say so. And yet Paul will testify not... Why is Jesus doing all this to me? He does not say, Lord, I'm serving you. Why are you making me suffer like this? You know what Paul says in the face of his suffering? Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Doesn't compare. Doesn't compare to know Jesus. It's far greater and far superior to any suffering we could ever endure for His namesake. It does not compare. Let's get back to the larger point. Saul's going to suffer. True believers do. But why does Jesus send Ananias to Saul? I said it's for Ananias' sake. Here's the first reason. Ananias needed to learn to obey when it's difficult. He needed to learn to obey when it's difficult. That's an important lesson, isn't it? That's an important lesson for all of us as Christians, to learn to obey Jesus when it is difficult. Because sometimes He's going to call on us to follow Him and obey Him, and the results are going to be consequences that are difficult, painful, and just hard. And so maybe our obedience to Jesus might lead to our being ridiculed. Maybe our obeying Jesus will lead to our own suffering. Maybe it will lead to our own persecution. Maybe the most common thing that happens is we have to deny our own desires and our own wants and the things that we would like in our life and set them aside for the sake of Jesus Christ. It means denying ourselves, denying our desires, our ambitions, our career plans. Maybe it means making less money. Maybe it means doing things that are going to lead to our pain and sorrow it's not easy to follow jesus and anybody who tells you it's easy is not telling you the truth it is not easy jesus never said it would be easy and we should not find it easy to follow jesus if you're finding the christian life to be a breeze i would humbly question whether you're following jesus There are multitudes of points where Jesus' desires and the desires of this world are at odds with each other. And if we are going to faithfully follow Jesus, we will feel that contention in our lives. In our human way of thinking, this seems like Jesus is sending Ananias into a buzzsaw, right? And so Ananias has to learn to trust Jesus above what might happen to him. It's nice to hear Saul saved a different guy It's another thing to go set him and heal him, right? So he had to learn that obeying obeying Jesus is hard sometimes. Secondly, Ananias was sent to Saul to partner in God's mission, to partner in God's mission. So before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commissioned his disciples to do what? We just talked about in Sunday school, to go and make disciples, right? We just saw that. And, and, And I already showed you the pattern here in the book of Acts. Jesus accomplishes his mission through his church that means he uses men and women who are faithfully sharing the gospel to welcome sinners into his fold repentant sinners and that's humbling to think about jesus uses us for eternal work pretty cool right for eternal work he uses us to do things in this life that will reach into 
eternity. And so think about all the faithful witnesses that played a hand in your salvation today. You saved today? Who led you to the Lord? Who led you to the Lord? Let me ask you a question. Who led them to the Lord? And who led them to the Lord? And who led them to the Lord, right? This is, we are all the result of faithful, ordinary, anonymous believers faithfully sharing the gospel with others. Parents passing it down to kids. Neighbors sharing with their neighbors. Co-workers sharing with their co-workers. Going all the way back to the apostles. When Jesus says, go and make disciples of the nations. They did it. By God's grace, they did it. We are here today because they did it. And there are countless faces and names who are responsible for us being saved today, if you're saved today. And now Jesus calls on us to do what? Go and tell others. Go and bear witness of His glory and grace and His salvation, that He died for our sins, that if you trust in Him by faith, you'll be forgiven, and that you have eternal life. And so every Christian is called to partner in the mission of of Jesus, and it's a privilege, it's an honor. It's the it's a, it's a greatest gift you could ever possibly give to some, another person. Thirdly, Ananias was sent to Saul to witness the power of the gospel. To witness the power of the gospel. So Ananias is understandably nervous to go to Saul. Saul had been a ruthless beast devouring Christians. Really, that's kind of the way Luke describes him, like an animal ripping Christians apart. But Ananias is now going and he's going to get a front row seat to the power of Jesus Christ to completely and utterly change a person. Ananias is going to see the power of the gospel on full display. And so he's going to get the first witness of one of the most zealous enemies of the church, enemies of Jesus Christ, becoming a humble, faithful follower of Jesus. You ever witness a change like that in somebody? Only Jesus can truly change people like this. Only Jesus can radically alter a person. Only Jesus raises the dead to life. Only Jesus takes hearts of stone and replaces them with hearts of flesh. Only Jesus makes the blind men see. Only Jesus can make the deaf people hear, right? Only Jesus can alter people, change people, transform people. Ananias is getting this front row seat of the power of Christ in a person who can radically change a person 180 degrees. So Ananias is sent to Saul for the benefit of his own soul and to strengthen his his own faith. Secondly, we're going to see that the reason Jesus sent Ananias to Saul was not just for Ananias' sake, but also for Saul's sake. For Saul's sake. Take a look at verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. First note that Ananias does, we, we should point out, is he obeys Jesus. So he, he, he questioned, Lord, are you sure? And, but he obeyed. He went, right? He goes to the house where Saul is. He lays his hands on Saul and confirms that Jesus appeared to him on the road. And now that Jesus had sent him to restore his sight and fill him with the Holy Spirit. What happened when Ananias did this? Immediately, immediately, Saul's vision is restored. Look at verses 18 and 19. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. Luke says something like scales fell off of his eyes. You ever wonder about that? Like, sounds like a reptile or something like that. Um... Some commentators question, maybe it's just a metaphor for the blindness leaving Saul, and that's certainly possible. But remember, Luke is a doctor, and so he probably had a keen interest in talking to Saul. What exactly fell from your eyes when, this, when all this happened? Uh, so anyhow, the, the point is the same. Saul's vision is restored. And Ananias was used to restore Saul's sight. And what's the first thing Saul does? When he can see again. Now, let me remind you, 
he has not eaten for three days. What's the first thing he does? He gets baptized. He gets baptized. That's amazing. Baptism is a big deal. It's a big deal. And I'd be human nature for me to say, well, yeah, maybe I'll have a burger first, and then we'll go down to the river, right? I'm, I, it's really, I'm hungry. No, before we eat, before we eat, he goes, we need, I need to be baptized. And so Saul is making an immediate public declaration of his faith in Jesus. That's a big deal for him. The guy who was notorious for hating Jesus and hating the church is now doing what publicly? He's identifying with, his, with, with the one he hated. He's identifying with Jesus. So why does Ananias, why is he sent for Saul's sake? First reason here. Saul had to learn dependence. Saul had to learn dependence. Again, we know that Jesus did not just handle this conversion one-on-one. He doesn't do that, right? He goes out of his way to include a representative of his church, Ananias, in this healing. And so Saul is learning from the start what? He needs other believers. He needs other believers. Now, Saul was a tremendously gifted person. You read his letters, he's brilliant. Clearly, right? And yet Jesus is teaching him how members of the body of Christ need each other. They need each other. And you go ahead and read what Paul would go on to write in 1 Corinthians 12. He call, compares the, hu- the church to what? We're like a human body, right? We're like a human body. And we're all different body parts. And every body part relies and needs on the, uh, upon the other body parts. And so the eye just can't tell the hand get lost. The eye needs the hand. The hand needs the eye, right? And the foot can't tell the leg, I don't need you anymore. It's necessary. And so there's an interdependence in the body of Christ. That's why it's always dangerous when you see believers off on their own. Trying to follow Jesus by themselves. We need the church. We need the body of Christ. We are far greater together than we are on our own. Secondly, Ananias is sent to Saul so that he can be healed. He can be healed. Jesus can heal people any way he wants to. Did you know that? One of the cool things to do is go ahead and study the Gospels and take note of the different ways Jesus heals people. Because sometimes he'll just touch them. Sometimes he'll pick up some mud and spit in it and then smother it on your, on your face, right? He does that. And then there's sometimes, like with the centurion servant, where he's miles away and he goes, okay, good, he's healed. You can go now, right? From, far di- from long range healing. Okay? So he's, he's not limited to how he can heal people. He does not need Ananias to go and heal Saul. But why is he sending him then? Why is he sending him? Last week I told you that I believe Saul's blindness, it is physical but it's also symbolic of his spiritual blindness. Okay? It's symbolic of his spiritual blindness. And so what we have here is Ananias touching, laying hands on Saul and bringing about restoration to his vision so he can see again so Saul can now physically see but there's something more happening here because this is a double miracle this is not just a a restoration of physical sight it's a healing of physical sight and spiritual sight the scales are a symbol of Saul's spiritual blindness as well and so Ananias is sent to perform a double healing physical healing spiritual healing and that's why you notice what he says I've come here to lay my hands on you so that you might see and what Be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is one of the chief works of the Holy Spirit? What does He do? He opens our blind eyes to help us see who Jesus is. The Scriptures are clear that only the Holy Spirit can help us understand the Gospel. Only the Holy Spirit can help us see the truth about Jesus. And so Saul is being given true vision, true healing, and he's using Ananias to bring it about. So the question is, Have your eyes been opened? Can you see? Have you seen the truth of Jesus? Do you understand why we're so carried away about Jesus every week? Right? Do you you understand why I'm up here every week preaching about this guy? Have you seen the truth about him? How he's the only way to have your sins forgiven? How he's the only way to help you have eternal life? The trust in him by faith. 
And if you can see, do you know why you're able to see? It's only because the Holy Spirit helped you to see. And if you don't see the truth about who Jesus is, your greatest need right now is for the Spirit to open your eyes. And I would just tell you to plead with them to open your eyes to see the truth about Christ. Plead with God to help you to see. Because only God can heal your vision. Only God can do it. Thankfully, he'll use people like us to spread the gospel, like Ananias, to share the truth. And God will open the eyes through his church, ministering faithfully with the gospel. This takes us to a third reason Ananias was sent for Saul's sake, and that is to be welcomed into the family. To be welcomed into the family. Notice what Ananias does when he comes to the house where Saul is praying. Look back at verse 17. What does Ananias do? He lays his hands on Saul. Now, commentators connect the laying on of hands with Saul regaining his sight and with Saul receiving the Holy Spirit. And then it leads to his baptism and breaking the fast, right? All that's true, but I think there's something more happening here as well. What are Ananias' first words to Saul? Look at it. What does the text say? Brother Saul. See it. Brother Saul. So I want you to imagine you're Saul. You've been blinded. You've been humbled. You haven't eaten in three days. Your world has been rocked. The guy that you thought was an imposter and a heretic actually blinded you. He rose from the dead. He's got God's glory. Uh, your, your world is in shambles right now. You had a traumatic encounter with Jesus Christ. You realize, uh-oh, I've been attacking innocent people and now you've been given this vision from Jesus that this guy Ananias is coming to you and the first encounter the first words that Saul hears from a Christian is what brother Saul Ananias is welcoming him into the family he has been sent to show that Paul has been accepted into the family of God. I love what John Stott writes about this. Let me just read it to you. He says, Even more, I suspect that this laying on of hands was a gesture of love to a blind man who could not see the smile on Ananias' face, but could feel the pressure of his hands. At the same time, Ananias addressed him as Brother Saul or Saul, my brother, I never fail to be moved by these words which Saul heard from Christian lips after his conversion, and they were words of fraternal welcome. Can you imagine the guilt that Saul was dealing with? When he's coming to the grips with all that he had done and what he was guilty of, and, and the way he was approving of Stephen. He was approving of Stephen being stoned to death. Right? And he... He's getting men and women. He's throwing them in prison. He wants to kill them all, right? That's what he wants to do. He's the arch enemy of the church. He's the arch enemy of Jesus. And now here, we have a follower of Jesus coming to Saul. And he says, brother. Brother Saul. And we really appreciate how this would have, those words would have rang in Saul's ears. What they would have meant to him. You see, Jesus transforms enemies into family members. That's what he does. He did that for you. If you're saved, we're all born as enemies of God, dead in our sins, right? If you're saved today, he transforms you from an enemy to a family member. That's what he does here. That's why Ananias is sent, because Saul can't welcome himself to the church. Can he? he he's going to show up, guys, I'm here. I'm part of the family, right? No, no, no. He is welcomed in. And we're going to see a continuation of this with Barnabas. Because even when the apostles in Jerusalem are scared of Saul and saying, "Ah, we need to hold off on this guy. We see if this is legit. It's Barnabas who says, no, no, no. He's true. He's genuine and welcomes him in. You can't get that outside of the body of Christ. This takes us to a fourth reason Ananias was sent for Saul's sake. And that was to witness the power of the gospel. To witness the power of the gospel. I said that about Ananias, didn't I? He was sent to witness the power of the gospel. Guess what? Ananias was sent to Saul, so Saul could also witness the power of the gospel. How is that? Saul 
now is given a front row seat to how he has been personally welcomed into the church even though he was its chief persecutor. Only the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ can do this. Only the grace of the gospel of Jesus can lead its church to embrace its fiercest enemy. It's the power of the gospel which enabled Stephen to pray for the forgiveness of those who were killing him. Oh, and by the way, was that prayer answered? When Stephen was being killed and stoned to death, and he said, Father, forgive them. Jesus, forgive them. Was the prayer answered? Well, here's one answer. This guy, Saul, was there. Stephen was praying for him. And now he's forgiven. He's part of the family of God. And so when you receive forgiveness and are welcomed into the family of people that you are wronging, that's a portrait of how God forgives us and welcomes us in Christ. Right? This all puts the gospel on display in powerful ways. Only the message of Jesus and what he did on the cross enables us to extend mercy and grace to people who hate us. All right? Saul benefited of receiving the forgiveness of Jesus, and then immediately, not only did Jesus forgive Saul, the church forgave Saul. Did you see that? There's a major problem when the church is not following the actions of Jesus. And we should always be examining ourselves as the church and saying, are we acting in a way that is not like Christ? Are we refusing forgiveness for people that Christ has forgiven? One of the things, I'm not going to jump ahead. I'm, I'm about to jump five sermons ahead right now. But one of the things in Acts 15 is amazing to me, right? Where the, the Holy Spirit's poured out on the Gentiles. And what, do the, what does the church do? That they're believing in Jesus, they have the gifts of the Spirit. What happened? The church has a meeting to determine if Jesus is allowed to save the people that they, he just saved. We can't be like that. We need to be in step with our Savior, right? And so he has forgiven Saul. He has brought Saul into the family. Ananias is that representative of showing the church also has forgiven Saul. This is the gospel in real life. We preach the gospel to ourselves. We preach the gospel every week. We have to live out the gospel. Forgiveness is not just an abstract theory. It's nice to forgive somebody in theory. No, no, no. Forgiveness happens in real life. That's how we show the gospel in real life. With repentance, with confession, with forgiveness. That's how we put the gospel on display. And so my question for you this morning is simple. Do you believe God can still change people like this? We know we should be praying for conversions, but do you ever, do you really think God's listening? And do you really think God is able to do it? Or sometimes we have to confess that maybe we pray with some doubts and saying, well, I'm going to pray for this, but I don't really think he's going to do it. Here he took his fiercest enemy and made him a beloved brother. He can do that today. Last week I challenged you to pray for somebody. You do it. You pray for that person and you, you know it's hard, a tough case, a hard case. Somebody that is just hard, rebelling against the truth of, of the scriptures. Keep praying. Keep beseeching the Lord to change, that he would change their lives. We need to be praying for the privilege that we would, our, our role is simple. It's not to make anybody believe. It's just to be like Ananias. It's like to be other faithful believers, like that lay preacher who got up and just said, turn to the Lord. Look to the Lord. We don't have to be eloquent. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to point people to Jesus. Are we pointing people to Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for this text we praise you for how you used Ananias, an otherwise unknown person, to really bring Saul into the fold, into the family of God. And we know you did that for a lot of reasons, Lord. I pray that those reasons would be made manifest in our own hearts and lives, and that, Father God, you would make them clear to us and show us our own role to play in pointing people to Jesus Christ for your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.